You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. incredibly excited to dive into this week's episode. And I guess to set the frame for this particular conversation, Brad and I both believe that financial independence is a replicable process for everybody. Anybody can do this, but it doesn't mean that we're all starting from the same place. And to assume that we are is intellectually disingenuous. So today, what we wanted to do is have Jillian and Kirsten from richandregular.com on the show to talk to us just a little bit to help us set a framework for financial independence and the black community. And the purpose of this episode is twofold. One, to understand from a historical perspective why we're not all starting from the same place with regards to our path to fight. And then two, how to bridge that divide, how to bridge that gap. Because If we can truly give everybody the tools they need, regardless of life circumstance, to pursue financial independence, the world is a better place. And to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How are you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan. I'm doing quite well. And yeah, I'm incredibly excited about this conversation, most especially because of a missed opportunity that I had. We actually sat next to them on stage on a panel at FinCon, and I just introduced myself, maybe at most, just said hello, and didn't get to have a conversation with them. I was thinking, oh man, we all got whisked away at the end of it and I missed that conversation. I didn't catch up with them. So this is the perfect opportunity for me personally to get to meet Julian and Kirsten. And also this is about stories, right? That's what Jonathan, you and I have determined over the 200 plus episodes is people relate to other stories. That's how humans relate to each other. I'm just fascinated to learn about their story. And I'm sure there are going to be so many people in the audience who connect to them and to their story. So with that, Julian and Kirsten, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Hey guys, how are you? Doing so good and so excited to have you here and explore your story. You guys have been writing about financial independence and the FIRE movement and really creating this content that acknowledges both the headwind and the unique challenges of people of color pursuing this path to financial independence, embracing the concept of financial independence. And I'm curious for you guys, where did your story begin? What got you, what prompted you to start writing about this type of content? Uh, We started writing in our heads, I would say, as early as 2013, 14. We didn't really. And what I mean by that is literally in our heads or you know, on a flight, you know, because we were both traveling quite a bit for business and you just had these uh, frustrating moments and you just start jotting notes down on your iPhone. But we didn't share any of this stuff until 2017, September 2017. Now, if you were going to rewind that, Before you were even thinking about writing about this, what got you interested individually and then together about personal finance? Well, that's part of our origin story and the way that we met. Uh, And I guess I'll just give you a brief rundown. I mean, we met that we met at work. So typical work love story. Uh, We met in 2012, started on the same team on the same day, ignored each other for a couple of weeks, uh, but then naturally gravitated to each other. A lot of uh, fireworks and cocktails in between good times, travel, and bad times as well. But then we stumbled into a really uncomfortable conversation about money. I said something I probably shouldn't have said, but she reminds me of every chance she gets. Um, But all of that to say, we we stumbled into conversations about personal finance. Now, at the time, I I was knee deep in uh, the blogs and you know, reading as much as I could about trying to build passive income, but fire was still new to me at the time. And so it was like an individual endeavor. Uh, But then over time, as we started to see that space growing and podcasts were blowing up and there were so many other perspectives, our story felt like one that wasn't really being told. And we got tired of looking for stories from our meaning a black perspective and said, well, why don't we just solve the problem ourselves? And so far it's been great. Kirsten, Julian said that you stumbled into this uncomfortable conversation. Was it uncomfortable because of of your individual backgrounds, your 
thoughts about money. Talk me through that. Yeah, I would love to remind him again of <laughs> <laughs> what he said. It was uncomfortable because we, we were absolutely coming from two different places uh, when it came to money. So I was a natural spender. I still am. I still have to fight with that, even on my path to fire. But at the time, I was a normal 20-something with a lot of credit card debt, as well as card notes and other consumer debt. And as we were traveling and drinking and having the whirlwind romance, I was racking up a lot more debt. And so one trip that we got back from, uh, Julian realized that I had paid for it pretty much exclusively on credit cards. And it's not like I had the cash to pay off those credit cards. And so he said that had he known that I had credit card debt, uh, he would have never dated me. Oh, throwing the gauntlet down. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So that's why the conversation was uncomfortable because he um, had attached, you know, pieces of my personality, places where I thought we connected emotionally to this sort of abstract thing of debt. And at the time I didn't understand, I had never been shamed about my spending choices. And that's what it felt like. It just felt very vulnerable. And so I was coming into the conversation on the defense and that's what made it uncomfortable. Julian, I'd love to come back to you and talk a little bit about your money story, you know, and the contrast between you and Kirsten, you know, when you guys were having this conversation, this hard conversation, clearly you're coming from a different place. Where does your different perspective come from? It comes from, you know, I guess what people will will refer to as a scarcity mindset. I grew up in 1980s Brooklyn, New York City. We didn't know this at the time, but it was called the crack era for a reason, because, you know, just as you see it, maybe you're watching, you know, one of those documentaries or something and you're flashing back to the 1980s and it just looks terrible. That's where I grew up. And so it it looked just as bad as it did in those old episodes of uh, Law and Order. Um, That was my life. And so that to me was the backdrop of my childhood. When I wasn't in Brooklyn, I was spending summers. I come from a, a Jamaican background, West Indian background. And so I would spend my summers and weeks at a time in Jamaica, in the countryside, and it was also very, very poor. And so if there's one thing we knew how to do, it was to stretch a dollar, to stretch a meal, uh, to make whatever you have last as long as possible. And so that's where I came from. And so I grew up in that sort of environment. I grew up in that sort of household. And so just as much as she is a natural spender, I'm a natural saver. Uh, and it's almost at problematic levels now. You give me some money and I'm like, oh, no, don't. You know, you know, I have 100 percent savings rate until you convince me to part with a dollar. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And so I'm learning to uh, enjoy life a little bit more. Um, and I'm grateful that, that Kirsten uh, has showed me how to spend. But but that's basically my background. And so we just come from two totally different worlds. And even in young adulthood and, you know, in my young 30s, it was still sort of rearing its ugly head in the case of me making really stupid statements like I did when we were dating. Kirsten, that's the big deal, right? Like I've never been shamed about my spending choices, you said. That's a really big conversation to have. And like you said, you felt attacked. I mean, how how do you move forward? Because obviously the punchline of this is you're together many years later. How did you work to get beyond that? Um, It was a lot of podcasts and blogs, honestly, and a lot of just heart to heart conversations. We went through a period where, you know, we would sort of audit every experience. (laughs) So we would go out to dinner and we would have, you know, maybe Chinese food one day and Julian would say, okay, did that experience make you happy? It was like, yeah, sure. And then he'd say, okay, if we did that three more times every week, would that make you happier? Like, is it a true static happiness or is it just like in the moment, just trying to figure out how to define our, at least my joy, where I derived my happiness from without attaching money was this exercise that we had to take it bite by bite with every dollar spent. Like, okay, you bought this thing at Target. If you had five more, would you, would you, would your happiness grow exponentially? That coupled with reading a lot of well-known blogs, uh, listening to Dave Ramsey, which was very helpful in my debt payoff stages, but became less helpful as I was pursuing fire, was our starting point. That is amazing. I mean, Julian, where did you come up with that system? I mean, I understand you were reading personal finance blogs and such, and I spent the last 10 years reading personal finance and five blogs, and I don't think I ever would have thought to have that kind of level of detail about experiences. Did you formulate that yourself? Talk me through that. 
I don't want to give myself the credit for it because I, but I can't answer that question. I have no idea, but I do know that you hear about this all the time now, right? Like people, you know, quantifying these things and writing it down. But I will say because of my background, I have an MBA. I just remember sort of like piecing together these ideas around business planning and and experiences. We also have deep backgrounds in hospitality, uh, in the hospitality industry and in hotels specifically. And so it, it was a combination of all of those things where it was like, all right, if, for example, you pay more for a corner room or you pay more for a room and a resort with a view or and one with, let's say, 20 extra square footage and they are all priced accordingly. And so I just kind of took that same mindset and said, all right, well, if you you know, you got this thing, or if you got a different version of that thing or more of those things, was that really, really worth it? And I just sort of enjoy the process of applying business principles to my personal life. But I think the same sort of process a lot of other people are doing, they just may call it something different. I just knew that we had money, we had uh, an opportunity to do something really, really long lasting with it. And every decision we made to spend that money, I just thought needed to be thoughtful. And it was one of the things that we did. And we still sort of do it naturally today. Yeah. I mean, I think it was also somewhat of a reaction to this very crafty, binary measuring stick that I was using for, for purchases, which is, can I afford it? That was the only rationale of like why I would buy something. And afford it meant I had that room on my credit card, like enough balance to for the swipe to clear, or I had, you know, just gotten paid. And so what Julian did was force me out of that logic and say, there's more to life than just being able to afford things. <laughs> you should enjoy the things. And Marie Kondo, bless her heart, has got a whole Netflix show on, you know, things sparking joy. And it was something that I had to be kind of jolted out of because I was just so used to using only math and not necessarily good math because clearly I was in the negatives, but to, to justify a purchase versus something a little more intangible. All right. So this is really fascinating. I, I have just a general question for the two of you. And Julian, maybe maybe we'll start with you since you were the one who brought this horror onto you that, that Kirsten doesn't let you forget. Right. But but I mean, you had this conversation and said, like, I don't know if I would have started dating you had I known. I've heard that before in the Phi community. And I mean, people wonder, how do I have that conversation? What if the person who I'm dating or I'm in love with has thousands of dollars of debt or has credit card debt or payday loans or something like, how do you have that conversation? And I guess more importantly to the two of you, how do you advise people who read your blog and people, you know, to have that conversation going forward? Well, let me clarify it. My issue was not so much the debt or the uh, amount of debt that she had, because Kirsten has a remarkable ability to convince people to pay her more and more money. Like, I have no idea how she does it, but <laughs> she's gifted uh, in doing that. And so, you know, like I wasn't worried about that part. It was about her relationship with money and her mindset. And at the time I had come out of a relationship that quite honestly, money was a big problem in that relationship and, and part of the reason why it ended. And obviously I'm, I'm glad the way that things worked out. So I knew that having just come from a relationship where, uh, where there was money conflict that I didn't want to go through that again. And I knew what direction I was going in. I knew the sort of content and belief system that I was forming at the time. And there was no way that I, you know, you could have one person that is intrigued by building multiple streams of passive income and potentially retiring early and another person buying red bottoms and Chanel, you know, bags or whatever the hell it's called, right? It just doesn't work. Uh, maybe for some people, but for me, I just knew it just absolutely would not work. And so that's where I was coming from. But I would say for other couples that are in that situation, you know, have uh, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of conversations. And if you have to have a lot of conversations over a couple of glasses of wine, then that's fine. But talk a lot, talk early, talk often. And I would also say be forgiving and give each other the flexibility to change your mind because you may feel really, really passionate about something now. And then a couple months from now, your life changes and you're not as passionate about it as you were. And that's okay. Your life and your mind is supposed to evolve over time. So uh, that's the advice that we would give other couples or I would give other couples. Maybe, she, maybe Kirsten has a different point of view. I mean, I think I would just say that we approach money consciousness the same way that we approach every other type of consciousness that evolves over time, whether it's, you know, your feelings towards 
women or towards human rights or towards political parties or towards the environment. There are just certain things that matter more over time. It's a very delicate conversation, so I would not advise taking Julian's uh, approach, but it's one that isn't a one and done. And so as long as the person who is trying to lead that conversation understands that it's something that takes place over time, I think you approach it in a more delicate way. Let's talk about the negatives. You're a couple overcoming vastly different economic backgrounds and spending habits. You're, you've decided to build a life and a family together. What sort of negatives are you actually dealing with from a debt perspective? What do you have to clean up before your financial freedom clock actually begins? At the time, I had a car note. I had a credit card that was all on high interest, you know, 29, 30% sort of retail cards. So all every month I was paying the minimum, but the balance wasn't going anywhere. And I had a very expensive apartment in Midtown Atlanta. And so I was spending way more than I was making every month. And then Julian had um, student loans. I had a car note. Um, We had tax debt because we were on a spending plan with the IRS. Um, And our mortgage. And our mortgage. So the obvious follow up to this, this is where you are. You know, I think first it always starts with getting your financial life down on paper, having some process to track it, or at least know where you stand at a given point in time. Where did you go from there? The next step for us to really is putting that plan into action and being bold enough to actually, you know, we refer to like paying down debt as like you know, chopping down a redwood tree. And so being bold enough to pick up that ax. And then, you know, this case, the ax is, this is a metaphor for your disposable income and literally start hacking away at this mountain of debt or whatever it is you want to call it. That takes a lot of courage because in most cases, and I'm sure a lot of the listeners know that you're going to be like on an island by yourself. You're going to feel like you're on an island. But that was the first thing. It was, all right, well, let's start paying these cards off. And once you pay it off, you celebrate. And, and when you do this other thing, you celebrate. And if you get a raise, you just add it to to your hand and you keep on hacking away. Uh, and so we did that for, gosh, maybe two, three years. You know, we got promoted several times. We got bonuses. And then we took it a step further and said, you know what, let's start using this opportunity to uh, to start laying or planting seeds for the future. And so we picked up an investment property. In 2014, our plan was to continue to do that or to just start doing other things so that we can diversify our income streams and attack this thing on both angles, on both ends, rather. And Julian, you use the phrase passive income a couple of times just in the the 20 minutes we've been talking. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Was there always this plan? Like, was it investment property? Was that your plan generally or was it just, hey, I'm taking in all this information I'm going to try a bunch of things. Talk me through the strategy in theory and then what you guys have actually done moving forward. Yeah. So I don't want to derail the conversation, but, you know, you know, we spoke about our journey to find how it's different for African-Americans um, and it sort of overlaps into work culture as well. And, and the unfortunate reality is, and I'm speaking from my perspective, I never felt that secure. I was doing well in my job, but um, the further I looked up, the fewer people that I saw that looked like me. I, I had very little reason to believe that there were opportunities for growth at the company that I worked for. And a lot of my family and friends had the same experience. And so, you know, that to me was a red flag. And it was, a, I, I just felt like even though I was doing well, considerably well compared to my friends, that I was on a shorter timeline than anybody else. And I was right, actually. I knew that, hey, if if I want to continue this sort of lifestyle, I've got to take greater control and make better choices for myself. I cannot assume that I will continue to earn like I am earning. I cannot assume that if I do the same work, that opportunities will open up for me. I just could not assume that. And so uh, that was the plan. And so real estate was obviously a really uh, great opportunity to do that. It's straight out of page one on the the playbook of building uh, income. I use the term passively, but, you know, it's still hard work. I, I need to figure out another word, you know, because there's nothing passive about it in some days. Um, but it, it's more so the idea that whether I decide to get up and hop in a car and go somewhere on Monday at nine o'clock, um, I am still earning money in some way. And my goal was to continue to do that. Um, and I tell people all the time, you know, I, I want people to fall out of love with the six-figure job and fall more in love with building, you know, a series of 
passive income streams. And, you know, it can do it in a number of ways. And, you know, just Google it or read our blog or other blogs. But for me, it was a matter of protecting myself and protecting my family. So, Julian, in there you said a shorter timeline. And I was right, actually. I think many of us don't know the realities. I don't know what that means. I would love for you to educate me. Please tell me what you meant by that. It's a really difficult thing to talk about, but I know and that a lot of black families, right? You know, you talk about the talk and we actually wrote about this just not too long ago on our blog, but a lot of black professionals at some point have been told that you're going to have to work twice as hard to get half as much. And we take that to heart. And so we work hard and we go to school and we, you know, at all costs and we uh, go into the workplace and we work hard and we expect to sort of get the same result. But over time, we realize that it just doesn't happen. We don't we don't get promoted as much. And, and these are just facts. I mean, you can look at organizational charts. You can look at the number of African-American uh, CEOs. And we would casually do this with our friends all the time. You say, how many VPs are there? Um, how many uh, directors are there? And you just keep on going down. And the further down in the organization you go, uh, the more people of color that you would see. And so it was a sort of a signal that uh, we just were not on a level playing field. And I say that knowing that these are people, by and large, who were just as qualified, but they just did not seem to have nearly as much I wouldn't say luck or, or as many opportunities to grow as many of their their white counterparts. And that's particularly frustrating in a city like Atlanta, which you've got tons and tons of educated black talent that just can't seem to rise the ranks in these organizations. And so that's a problem. And, and you know, for us, it was something that we experienced and said, you know what, we're not going to continue to climb a slippery corporate ladder. We're going to take matters into our own hands. I don't want to ask a, a naive question, but is this getting better at all? You're saying that you're seeing more people of color at the lowest levels. Do you foresee this getting better? Do you Is it getting better at all? Or is it just an entrenched system that just does not seem to be improving at all? I'm going to be the Debbie Downer and say, no, it's not getting better. The wealth gap is stubbornly large. It's not shrinking. And the reason that we started Rich and Regular and not rich and rescued is because we do feel like there is some level of empowerment on the personal finance level. At the end of the day, the wealth gap and, and the biases and inequality that we're talking about is something that is systemic and institutional and can only be resolved at the macro level, at a policy level. And so to avoid that conversation, we then focus on personal finance, which you can control within your unique spending choices. And so my journey is more of a, a mindset one. It's grappling with uncomfortable legacies around Black people and freedom. It's grappling with feelings of worthiness and deserving. I, unlike Julian, don't have the same struggles at work currently. It's not to say that I won't ever have them, but I have been promoted several times in the last year, and I am on a trajectory to earn more. But there's a different feeling of, not feeling like I belong there or not feeling that I'm worthy of the same things as some of my peers, that's my struggle. You know, one of the things that you actually mentioned there was uncomfortable legacies. And, you know, while Brad and I have gone to the ends of the earth not to have a political show, I am very comfortable for this conversation talking about this idea of the racial gap, because I think it's informative for people that are on the path just to kind of have a framework. And I'd be curious if you, for our audience, could talk a little bit about the racial gap. And if you're in the black community and you're and you're pursuing financial independence, whether or not you have a word for it or not, but financial independence, getting to the point where working is optional, what are the obstacles or maybe the headwind that we maybe don't see or don't have a full appreciation for? Yeah, I love having this conversation. So thank you for um, teeing it up. But I think whether we agree politically or not, we can all align on the fact that certain groups of people have had to work harder so that others can achieve more. That's just capitalism in a nutshell. In America, it has the unique history, maybe not so unique, slavery is not unique to America, but African Americans were disproportionately affected by the way that American business started. And so when you look at my family specifically, like my mother was born in 1954, sorry, mom, but that's the <laughs> same year that 
schools became integrated. It's the first year it became illegal to have segregated schools. And so when you think about the education that my mother received, the education that my grandmother received, it's very different than the education that their white counterparts received. We are not far removed from Jim Crow laws and all of the effects that happened after slavery. Like once slavery ended, it's not like everything went to equal. There were still large incentives in place to keep the proportion of society that was working very hard to make a few people rich in those same positions. And so when you talk about the initial wealth builders of a lot of white Americans, which is access to land, access to housing, those things were systemically denied from African Americans. We weren't able to participate in that wealth grab. We weren't able to vote to adjust policy. We weren't able to live in certain areas that had increasing home values. And so we're starting from a different place in that we don't have generational wealth, which is really important if you are talking about taking courage, as Julian mentioned earlier, to make bold choices with your career or to explore different educational avenues. There's not a safety net there in the same sense for a large population of African-Americans like there is for our counterparts. You made a great point with regards to the generational transfer and also the lack of a safety net. And you reference how in the black community, it's kind of like you start to bump up against this ceiling in middle management, and it makes it increasingly hard as you move up the corporate ladder. W-2 income isn't the only way that you know wealth is built. Obviously, we talked just a little bit more about real estate. What about using real estate as a vehicle for financial independence? Real estate, yeah. I mean, open up any book about how to build wealth, and they will say buying a home is one of the best decisions that you can ever make. But to Kirsten's point, you know, and not to turn this into a history lesson, you know, you go back to the 50s and you talk about, you know, the expansion of the highway system and the creation of suburbs. To her point, right, Black people were not even allowed in a lot of cases to purchase a lot of these homes. In a lot of cases, they weren't even allowed to get mortgages because they did not uh, have bank accounts or could not get bank accounts and so on and so on. And so, These are systemic barriers that unfortunately led to the creation of massive amounts of wealth that have been passed down uh, to a lot of people today that are still sort of benefiting from that. But that blueprint, that experience, those lessons were not shared in Black America uh, nearly uh, as much because they did not happen at the same rate. Well, what about the stock market? Yeah, well, I mean, you need... (laughs) <laughs> disposable income <laughs> to invest in the stock market, right? And so you, you can't invest what you don't have, not to mention, it's almost crazy to expect someone to think about what the value of a dollar could be 30 years from now when they're not really sure how they're going to make it to next month. And so that's part of the problem. And, and I think everyone's, not everyone, but a lot of people tend to Uh, say, hey, this is an equal opportunity. Everyone can do this. And they're right. Everyone can do this. A lot of people can if they have access to the internet or can walk into a bank and put that dollar in. But the risk is not the same for people without. And so you just got to be a bit more empathetic and think about the experiences and the historical legacy of certain systems uh, and the impact that that has on people's decision making today. I was just going to say there's also this implicit distrust of systems and institutions like banks that we have to overcome. So you'll see a lot of us in the space just working on basic financial literacy to help people understand how this stuff works. Because if you go back to our grandparents or our parents, they've been they've been taken advantage of by these same systems that we're now coming in and say, yes, invest, give to banks, give to institutions. And it's like, I don't know if I trust that. (laughs) So there's also just a mental hurdle that we have to overcome after the initial capital hurdle. What I'm trying to set up is basically work through the different asset classes. And we've talked about real estate and we've talked about the paper asset class, which is the stock market. You know, the other one that is available is business building, starting your own business. Now talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, building your own business also requires capital. And if we're being honest, right, there's a relatability factor there. And so, you know, black entrepreneurship, uh, I think, you know, I'm a big fan of that. Uh, or I should say black entrepreneurs, because I think it puts people in greater degrees of control and they are less reliant on someone giving them something. They can create uh, something uh, for themselves. But there are also inherent challenges uh, with that as well, particularly if you are relying on the black community exclusively, because 
there is significantly less wealth in the black community, meaning those people have less disposable income. And so the heart of your customers are going to be people who don't have a lot of money to spend anyway. And so the cycle is so voracious, if you will. And it just is it, really, really difficult out there. Uh, and on top of that, b- banks uh, unfortunately don't lend capital to black entrepreneurs at the same rate or at the same cost uh, as they do to their white counterparts. And so it's really difficult. And again, I don't want to make it seem as if, gosh, you know, there's nothing we can do. You can't buy real estate. You can't start a business. You can't, you know, invest in the stock market. Uh, We do literally all of the above, but we are relatively new to this. This is not something that has been accessible at mass for Black America for the last hundred years. I wanted to spend some time going through the different asset classes just to talk about a very real headwind that's there from both a historical perspective, but then also what the repercussions have are for the current generation. Because I know that you have a very optimistic message at richandregular.com, but it's tempered with reality. It is what it is. This is based on real life examples. Simultaneously, you guys are crushing it. And I don't know if you use the word blueprint. I don't know if this is a blueprint. Are you starting to document how to navigate that construct and how to optimize it, even if you have to deal with some of that headwind? Absolutely. That's our goal. It's about introducing this new picture of Black wealth. When you think about how the media portrays rich Black people, we're usually entertainers or we're athletes or we're Oprah or we're Obama. And there is a opportunity for a Black middle class that also has a playbook that isn't necessarily like out of reach. It's not, you know, starting the next Amazon, but it is making sure that you have an intentional value-based budget and that you make the decisions while the decisions are cheap and that you do leave your children with some sort of starting point that maybe wasn't afforded to you. And so it's really just our idea to document where... I don't say that we would position ourselves as experts because we're learning as we go, but it's more than what we found when we initially started our journey. Yeah, Kirsten, you're describing the black middle class. And and as I understand middle class America, it usually comes through education. And I just want to piece together a couple of, of things that you guys said previously, which is there's no generational wealth, but also I think, Julian, you said go to school at all costs. You said that very much in passing, but there's a noxious mix there without generational wealth and going to school at all costs. And I'm curious if you've thought about that and, and do people in the black community face even more student loan debt because of that noxious mix? Oh, 100%. I thought about it. I don't know why. Again, I think it's just in my nature, but, you know, and maybe this is a quick tip, but I... I I earned my MBA and uh, the hack that I used to earn that essentially for free was I went to the extent of making myself an employee at the school. I was a graduate research assistant. It gave me uh, some relevant work experience. It gave me a stipend, but more importantly, it gave me an opportunity to have a $25 tuition. And so I earned my MBA. I use those business skills to progress my career. I use it to build my business uh, all without having to incur a ridiculous amount of student loan debt. But that is not a story that's told. And, you know, obviously not everyone can do that or even would be willing to do that. But I will say, you know, like a lot of other families or other sort of ethnic groups, I believe that are just too many people following the old tried and true playbook, which is to go to school at all costs. It doesn't matter because it'll eventually pan out in the end. You will earn significantly more and you'll be able to do that. You know, we even had that conversation. I remember arguing at the dinner table with Kirsten's father about this because she was saying, you know, our generation was complaining too much. But, you know, he was completely unaware of just how much more expensive college had become from even when Kirsten went to school. So all of that to say that mindset is toxic because you've got a lot of people that are coming out with hundreds of thousands of dollars in student loan debt and absolutely no way to earn their way out of that in their given field. Talk to us more about the financial independence playbook. What if the black community you know, embrace this? What if you could actually get 10% of the black community to embrace this? What would that mean? Like, what if your vision actually were to come true? What, what, what sort of generational transformation would occur? 
I think it would be the single greatest tsunami of community, you know, activism that our community has ever seen. One of the things that really frustrated me is we all have these beliefs and social causes that we believe in. And in the age of social media, we can all tweet about these things that we are passionate about. But a lot of these tweets just fall on deaf ears. They don't do anything, right? Why I'm really, really interested in the FIRE movement is not just a way to improve people's lives, but for it to be a a lever to create social change, especially for Black middle-class America, is because if you have financial independence, you've achieved that, you have that time, now you can reroute that time to things that matter more important to you, and particularly for our community where there are so many problems. And even if you're not talking about things specific to the to the African-American community, it could just be, you know, now you're going to get that much more engaged in your local community or your local park. But assuming you are particularly passionate as we are uh, about issues that are specific to the African-American community, you can reroute your time. Now you can do something about it beyond some of the work-sponsored events that everyone is sort of forced to do, if we're being honest, during the holiday season, right? And so those organizations, those groups that we all volunteer during the holidays, there are 11 other months <laughs> that we can all now be available if more people sort of freed themselves from uh, from their desks and, and allowed themselves to pour more of their time and energy into these social and community causes. Kirsten, when you're trying to introduce FIRE, FIRE to people in the Black community, people in Atlanta that you know, how do you broach the subject? Are there any differences that you'd imagine, like, I would bring this up to my own friends? I mean, again, I'm just trying to learn so desperately here. Are there differences or is this just, is it phi at the end of the day? Yeah, I mean, I think anytime you're having a personal conversation, it's like the mullet of conversation topics. (laughs) (laughs) Been there. It starts off fine and then it gets really serious really quickly. I try to take fire as a personal approach. I don't really try and convince people like it's some sort of religion or cult. I think people learn best from your example and not your opinion. And so when my friends see me being able to do things and hit me with it must be nice, then I can literally explain like, oh, great, this was funded by compound interest and like, you know, turn it into a <laughs> lot. <laughs> and it is. That is such a great bumper sticker. <laughs> right? <laughs> Put that on the back of your bug. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I I try not to judge their purchases. They know that like when they make weird purchases, they'll they'll say, I know you're not going to like this. But any point where you're judging someone's purchases or their financial decisions, it just kind of becomes conversational quicksand and it doesn't go anywhere fast. And so I just try to be an example. And I think a lot of people are intrigued. We get at least one or two notes every single week from other people who want to talk to their spouse about fire, or we might post something on Facebook and all of a sudden you see that little tag to the spouse and they're like, this is what I was talking about. (laughs) it's It's always nice to see that people are using us as a springboard to have the conversation in their house. But At the same time, you know, we're not relationship experts. We're not marriage experts. We're not even financial experts. We're just, we're regular people who had the courage to tell our story. And so we like to keep, you know, a healthy boundary around making people feel empowered to make this choice for their life, but also giving them some level of confidence because we're doing it first. Well, you're not just regular, you're rich and regular. And (laughs) 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 let's talk about your path to FI. Like, what's the plan from here? Where are you guys at on your FI journey? Yeah, carry us into the future a little bit here. Yeah, we like to say that we're two to three years away. We have a ideal date of January, sorry, not January, (laughs) July 2021 as like the day where I could walk away from my job. But we don't really have the traditional number that's associated with a lot of fire community people. I just don't feel like for us, it's more for, for us, it's more of a feeling and I just don't feel like portfolio size is a great indicator of freedom. And for us, it'll be like, when do we feel like we can live the life that we want without worry? And obviously we've done some math associated with that to come out to July, 2021-ish. But if that changes, if that comes sooner or later, we're not super attached to it. 
Jillian and Kirsten, so much incredible information here. And we're going to hop right into the hot seat. But before I do that, people listening to this are going to want to connect with you. They're going to want to find out more about what you're doing. What is the best way for someone to find out more about your content and to connect with you guys directly? Yeah, we're at richandregular.com. And then we're also on every social media platform, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter under Rich and Regular. All right. Now, on most shows, that would be the end of the episode. But on this show, we would love to give you the chance to tackle the hot seat. Are you ready for this? Yeah. Let's do it. In a world drowning in debt and rampant consumption, trapped by the chains of lifestyle inflation, these questions highlight the secrets of those who have broken free. Welcome to the Choose FI Hot Seat. All right, Kirsten, question number one, your favorite blog that's not your own. I'm going to go ahead and give it to a purplelife.com. She is a fire blogger. She's young, uh, well, younger, younger than me. Uh, she's not like a teenager uh, or a toddler, <laughs> but she just. <laughs> we have yet to find our first toddler blog. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> she is a fire blogger who discovered fire in her 20s. And she reminds me of like who I would be if I had discovered fire that early. I just find her writing very like open minded and free and just inspiring. Awesome. Question number two, your favorite article of all time. Now, this can be one that you wrote or someone else's. Yeah, we're going to be a little selfish uh, and we're going to say a uh, letter to middle class black America. It, it was uh, something that had been sitting on our hearts for years and we literally just published it uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, it is an invitation, if you will. It is a, a wake up call and hopefully it's something that will inspire uh, more people like us to consider fire uh, as a lifestyle. When I was uh, prepping for you know this particular show, I was reading through all of your content and you guys had just released that particular article. I was so excited about it that I immediately included it in the newsletter to our community because it is just such an epic, epic article. And I'm, and I'm glad you shared it with us. We'll obviously also put it in the show notes for today's episode. All right. Question number three, your favorite life hack. Favorite life hack, I would have to say, uh, is buying a new food every week. Um, we are big foodies. I actually used to be a chef. I used to cook professionally in another life. And so that's been one of the secret weapons for us. But the reason why I say buying a new food every week or just sort of adding a line item to try new things, because when you're trying to get out of debt, it's so easy to get frustrated, especially when you're not confident in the kitchen or you don't really know how to cook or you don't enjoy cooking. But when you buy a new thing every week, you really sort of challenge yourself uh, and it could be a fruit. So it doesn't even have to be like something that you want to cook, but even just getting a fruit that you wouldn't normally get helps to create a much uh, more fun experience. And I think makes people that much more interesting interested in food and interested in cooking. Have you ever had a lychee? Yeah, I have. <laughs> That's my wife introduced me to, to lychees. It's a very interesting fruit. Question, it is. <laughs> question number four, your biggest financial mistake. That would be me, not me as a person, but <laughs> <laughs> that was when debatable I'm... after that first lead in. From... <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> When I was 24, I purchased a luxury car, a $34,000 Lexus on a $40,000 salary, oh. um, and I leased it. So I had a $600 car note for five years, refinanced it after the lease for about the same total, ended up paying another $600 car note for another like five or six years. And so I think I paid for that car twice. I still drive it today, which is great, but <laughs> ultimately could have probably bought three or four cars. You look at that car and you're like, oh yeah, you are definitely worth 70 grand. No doubt. Right. Exactly. <laughs> wow. So 600 bucks a month for essentially 10 years. Yes. Wow. Okay. Not my proudest moment. Okay. But you're still driving it. So that's. I still great. drive it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Question number five, the advice you would give your younger self. And really, I think this is a bigger question just because of what we just talked about earlier. There's so much information that you guys have had to parse and put together with your work. Really, it doesn't have to be one single piece of advice. What information would you want to pass back to that person that's maybe listening to you, inspired by your story and wants to follow in your footsteps? 
Yeah. So mine is um, don't over tweeze your eyebrows. And two, your money can work way harder than you can. I thought for a long time that I could outwork, you know, my earning potential. But once I put my money to work in the markets, I realized like, oh, this thing is working 24 seven and that's way more than what I can do. So that would be mine. Uh, Mine would be start a business uh, as soon and as often as possible. I don't have, you know, story. Kirsten has stories of being, you know, a teenager and selling T-shirts. Like, I don't have that. I wish I'd gotten into the habit of starting businesses time and time again. I had tons of ideas, but I never had the confidence to take the leap until my 30s. And so I wish I had a few more notches in the belt in my teenage and in my 20s. Where did that lack of confidence come from? You know, what, what do you think it was? Cause you have it now in spades, right? What was it that was missing from that teenage version that prevented you from tackling it then? Uh, it was the environment that I was in without question. I mean, you know, I, I go back to, you know, just, I can imagine it very clearly. You don't see examples uh, of that at all in this sort of environment that I grew up in. And that's sort of, core to our message as well. We we understand just how important it is for people to look at an opportunity and to be able to relate to someone. And so if there's someone out there that's interested in fire and just seeing, you know, me and Kirsten makes them feel like we can do it, we're totally interested in helping them get there. But I didn't have anyone that I could relate to at that time. Now I do. And now we're making moves. So Kirsten, if you have that Gucci handbag, the the sticker that's on it needs to say funded by compound interest, right? Yes, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) We got a bonus question for you. And each of you can maybe take a stab at this. Your favorite purchase or the purchase that you've made over the past 12 months that's brought the most value to your life. So it's not really a purchase. It was actually a gift because my mother-in-law is amazing. Um, But she got us a, or me rather, uh, a Kamado Joe grill. It's like one of those big fancy ceramic grills that holds temperature and you can make pizzas or, you know, you can just do a regular grill. You can get that thing up to 900 degrees. It can be a smoker. It can be a rotisserie. Like it can do everything. But what it did for me uh, personally is it made cooking at home more fun. And the more we're cooking at home, the more we're enjoying family time, the more we're saving money by not eating out. And that's really just made home so much more enjoyable over the last couple of months. That's super cool. Is that something that's like available online or we can link to? I'd love to see that and put it in the show notes. Yeah. And I'd love to get some affiliate income. <laughs> um, they don't, they don't, ha- I don't even, they don't even have that sort of uh, program, but yeah, you can, you can link to it. It's K-A-M-A-D-O. Joe.com, okay. I believe. Kamado Joe. Well, if you're going to vouch for it that strongly, you should just email them. I bet you they will come up with a custom affiliate program yeah. for you. I know. I know. I'm really interested. But yeah, we'll see. I don't <laughs> need another thing on my plate right now. But, uh, but those things are super expensive, but they're worth it. Awesome. 2019 goals. Jillian and Kirsten, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you, guys. It was a really great time. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Brad, this is an episode that we both knew was important for so many reasons. One, because their journey has been incredible. And two, they are such remarkable spokespeople for the black community in particular. I mean, in particular for people that are pursuing this path to financial independence that are facing obstacles and challenges that me and you as two white suburban dudes in Richmond, Virginia, frankly, just don't appreciate and can't fathom. We want to, we try to, you ask questions passionately to try to have a better understanding, but it's not our origin story. And and I just love how they were able to help connect to this community and help us build this framework. Yeah, Jonathan, this was a really wonderful episode. I'm so glad they came on and told their story. And I mean, it's it's fascinating for me to learn things that are outside of my knowledge base. And and understanding that there was no generational wealth transfer for the black community. There's no real safety net in that regard. Living with that as your background and understanding that, as you said, there's, there's this headwind, yet they're moving forward in this incredible manner and they're teaching people in their community how to do so too. And, and that is just what it is all about. And yeah, just marvelous, marvelous people. And thanks again for coming on. All right, to our audience, 
If you got value from today's episode and if you've been getting value from the episodes up to this point, just take one second and press the subscribe button on the platform you're listening to this on. It just lets the providers know you're getting value from the show and you want to be here when we produce additional content. If you want to support us in what we're doing here at Choose FI, here are four easy ways. One, leave us an iTunes review. To do that, just go to choosefi.com slash iTunes. Two, use our page to sign up for travel credit cards. If you want to travel the world with miles and points instead of your hard-earned dollars, then just go to choosefi.com slash cards and get started today. Three, if you're working on the milestones of FI, set up a personal capital account to track your progress and use our affiliate link. It's completely free and just go to choosefi.com slash PC. P is in Paul, C is in Cat. And four, and most importantly, find your friends, coworkers, and family members who might be open to this message and tell them about the podcast. Have them start with episode 100. It is a fantastic starting place. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.